Some of you will be aware that I've been working in the Commonwealth for the last six years. In that period, both in Canberra and since I've been back, one of the most striking features is just how far ahead the level of knowledge and understanding of activity-based funding and health reform is within the New South Wales Senior Executive Service. And that's largely, in fact, primarily been due to the level of expertise brought to this conversation by our Director General. It's undeniably true that uh, Mary Foley has a greater understanding of activity-based funding than any Director General in the country. Um, Mary is now going to present to us the state funding model. Thank you for that introduction, Rowan. I've got a lot to live up to now. Um, uh, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the uh, Gadigal people of the Great Eora Nation, and acknowledge elders past and present uh, and here with us today. It's wonderful to have so many of you here. I think we've got about 500 people all up who are coming if, if, and... Uh, and uh, uh, that's a, 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 a big contingent from right across all our area health services and, and uh, health networks, pillars, statewide services. We have a range of people from, uh, we've got board chairs, board members uh, of districts. We have uh, clinical uh, staff. We have our executive uh, teams, uh, a whole range of uh, our health system here to, to uh, find out about what does activity-based funding mean in New South Wales and how, how are we going to uh, go about it. Uh, in this presentation I'm about to give, um, in about over about 40 minutes, I'm going to try and uh, work with you to take an audience who I know will have varying levels of knowledge and understanding of what we're about to talk about from you know, first introduction through to those of you who really want to get into the fine detail as to exactly uh, how budgets are going to work and, and, and uh, the, the technicalities of our, our pricing models and so on. So I'm going to endeavour to, to take us on a, a, a quite quick journey from, from sketching out the principles, um, the, uh, the context, both state and, and national in which we're now doing this, and then a deep dive uh, into what our actual budgets going out to districts might look like on, on uh, the 1st of July this year. Uh, and in doing that, try and put it in a, a context. I, I, um, in the time, uh, can't even begin to get to all the finer points, but don't panic if, if, if I lose you on, on, on at some points, because we'll, as, as Rowan said, we'll make this material available, plus it becomes the basis to, to then really approach the, both the panel session, which is after morning tea, and then even more importantly, the workshop shop sessions in the afternoon, where we can start to sort of take a, a deeper dive into some of this material and really explore it. The other caveat I have to give is that we are really still, I use the comment, you know, building the plane as we fly it, um, in, that, in that there's still a, a, quite a, a number of elements that have to be resolved over the next few weeks to get to our 1st of July starting position. One of those is, is the state budget, which comes down in uh, early June, and that's still very much in play. So, so we don't actually have all our, our final numbers to be able to conclude our, our, our state pricing exercise. So um, that necessarily creates some challenges. So I can't put definitive state price numbers up, which if you know, uh, in another month's time we'll be able to do that. Uh, and the other issue of, is, of course, that, that um, in terms of the national framework under which we're putting all of this is also in play and uh, IPA, IPA, comments on IPA's uh, proposed uh, national, initial pro national price determination and um, categorisation um, classification system that it's using and, and its specifications about what's in scope and not in scope for, for federal uh, funding and for ABF. Um, is all still in play as well. Um, and uh, we've just signed off of our, our comments back to it because they're, they're due today. So, so we also have elements of the, um, uh, of the national model which are unresolved. I mean, just to give you a flavour for that as to you know, what's in and in, what's out for, for, for being funded to, through the, 
the shared national model and what things will, will actually now be definitively state only funded, something we haven't had to make that distinction before. So there are a number of knowns, known unknowns and unknown unknowns, to quote some uh, uh, American former defence secretary. Um, uh, but uh, let's see how we go. I'm uh, really picking up from, from, uh, from the Minister and from, from Carol's comments about uh, the opportunities which uh, activity-based funding give to, to actually take us deep into understanding uh, how we uh, deliver our healthcare services and how we can improve those services for patients. I'll put right on the table, I am not an, uh, I'm not a, an ABF or case mix evangelist. Um, uh, it is just a very useful tool for making uh, our health system funding decisions and delivery decisions much more transparent. Critically, uh, activity-based funder is a major reform driver for better patient care, and that's why it f is featuring in, featuring in reform agendas globally, as we all try to work out how to design our health systems for the 21st century. Uh, it's, we've got Christine Bennett here with us today in, in her chair capacity but, uh, of one of uh, the networks, but, but as uh, chair of the National Health and Hospital Reform Commission, the commission uh, focused on activity-based funding as a, as a key element of, of the hosp public hospital reform side of the agenda uh, because of its capacity to, to bring change in our system in terms of how, how we think about uh, what we pay for, uh, what we deliver, how we organise that care and is it the right care. Globally, prospective case payment, which is a more generic term for what in this country we're calling activity-based funding, it's had lots of different names, Names, um, is used to fund hospitals in, in over 20 countries or 70% of the uh, OECD. And in fact, a large number of those countries, more than half, actually purchase the Australian DRG system for the inpatient component to do it. Countries like Germany and, uh, and Ireland, others like the UK developed, developed their own models. And, the most, and, and often it gets talked about that it's all about efficiency. And it's not really. Um, uh, yes, uh, uh, whether we're doing things efficiently in terms of cost um, is, is an element uh, that, that, that this drives when you compare the performance of, of different uh, hospitals or, or services. But the most critical thing about it and why it's very, very, very key to, to what we need to achieve in, a, in our devolved uh, uh, model is, uh, is that it gives the transparency which, which enables local planning and decision making, as well as the transparency that allows, uh, from a whole of state point of view, to, to actually work out where we're going with our health system. Uh, are we getting it right? What are the gaps? Um, uh, what are the access issues? Have we got the right models of care? Um, the, um, I've just put up a few thoughts about transparency there, this idea that, what it shifts is instead of funding being tied to to um, to the historical um, uh, uh, historically to organisations that we're actually now funding the services that that those organisations and providers provide. The Right Honourable Alan Milburn, who was Secretary of State for Health in the Blair government and conducted the uh, and led the the Blair government health reforms uh, a few years back describe this as, uh, as moving from paying providers for who they are to what they achieve. And it is a very important, a very important shift. And I'll explain it in very concrete terms to you um, as, as we go through this presentation. Uh, the benchmark, when, when you have a look at sort of nationally or statewide normative pricing and then look at your own health service and see whether you cost more or less, uh, it, it raises the questions of, of, well, why is that? And the answers can, as I say, answers can be efficiency. But they're also as to, to whether we're actually uh, have got the right care uh, in the right place uh, for the patient at, at the right time. It will also highlight gaps. One of the first things we, noti we will notice when we make our, our hospital budgets absolutely transparent as to what, what, what they're providing rather than what funding the, the institution is receiving uh, is, is we'll find huge diversity in, in patterns of care, huge diversity in even what, what uh, fundamental uh, services are delivered. I'll just use one, one example in terms of if you look around the, st 
state the enormous patchiness of the availability um, of uh, home-based um, palliative care, for example, uh, is not something you can routinely access uh, around this state. Um, and that then the fu and the funding model will take you there to 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 one be able to observe that and then to ask well well what is the right model of care how do we direct resources to the to the the right pattern of services people highlight that it can um, that it can uh, drive us towards a focus on volumes and certainly um, and throughput for throughput's sake. And, uh, and in terms of the structure within the national reforms, we have to be very, very careful that, that, um, that those incentives don't come into play. But if you can actually approach the design of your overall funding model in the right way, then the, the, the track record of uh, introducing these models is that, uh, that you, you can um, do it in a framework that gets you to focus uh, on, your, on your outputs firstly and then from outputs to outcomes because to answer the questions of why have we got that service configuration, why does it cost what it costs, will take you to the fundamental issues of have we got the right care. We've got two levels of reform happening here. Um, the Minister has talked about the, the, the state government's commitment to a devolved uh, model of care, of, of local decision making with strong clinician and community engagement. This is a theme of health reform globally. If we're going to organise care properly around the patient, uh, the models of care need to be localised around the patient. They need to be flexible and they need to be able to join the dots and connect up care across a range of providers and a range of settings. Uh, transparency is absolutely key to being able to support that local decision making. Uh, and, and as well, in terms of our state government um, model, we have to work within state budget parameters. Uh, so it's a critical piece of, of our state reforms. At the same time, of course, it's been a critical element as part of the national health reforms, picking up from the recommendations of the National Health and Hospitals Reform Commission. We first of all had the Rudd Plan that then um, uh, moved into the Gillard Plan and, uh, and then a national health and uh, reform agreement, which is what we're all working on, uh, on implementing now. Um, there's some important differences as I go around our health services um, I find that uh, you know, some people have got in their minds that some of the elements of the original Rudd plan are, are what we're implementing. That had the Commonwealth becoming majority funder, paying 60% of in-hospital care and 100% of out-of-hospital care. It had um, the Commonwealth contributing to, to the capital funding in the system. Um, but it had a number of states that um, weren't necessarily prepared to sign up to that model. It had uh, changes in the GST arrangements between Commonwealth states and various other challenges. The revised plan that was able to get all states on board uh, is, is a, a small subset, but still with some of the key reform drivers in, in it, but not all of them. Um, the critical thing is the model we're implementing has states and territory governments uh, are the key to the funding model for um, state public health care systems as they have always been. The states are the, the majority funders, the risk underwriters, the bankers. We have to fund the efficiency and the inefficiency. Uh, we, we have the responsibility for managing the system, for delivering an integrated system. And, and when people are overseas, uh, when you're in international forums and people, you, know, you proudly say, you know, Australia has a very good health system. If you're not well, you get on a plane and come home and <laughs> be treated in that system. I, most people are thinking of, I think, two elements of the Australian system. Uh, one is, is um, at, at the primary care level, is a, a good access for the most part to general practice. And, but the, the, on the other side of things, people are thinking about our integrated, organised public healthcare systems in this country, uh, which are well networked, well organised, and, and able to prove if you, you have a, a, an episode of illness, a trauma, are able to scoop you up in a retrieval system, get you into the right care, and see you through that process. That's what people are thinking of. And the states in our country have the responsibility for organising that organised part of the system. And of course, we have the operational responsibility and the accountability for that delivery. The federal government, in, in the process of the, of the arrangements, is, it's their job to put in place the, the various nat national structures uh, that are going to be part of this arrangement. 
and uh, they, they uh, are also now going to put their, their Medicare grant, as I still uh, call it, that's what it used to be called, um, and then it became the ACAS, the Australian Healthcare Funding Agreements. Um, but they're putting that amount that they always um, pay to the states in respect of offering free public hospital treatment, a contribution to state systems, which was negotiated every five years between premiers and uh, uh, prime ministers and treasurers. And uh, you might remember you'd have the, every year the five-year arm wrestle argy-bargy. Um, the amount would be set. The Commonwealth would um, then um, put that number in, in, into their forward estimates and it was set for the next five years. And that was their lump sum contribution to states uh, towards the system. And in return, the states uh, all agreed to uh, provide their services free to uh, all Australian citizens who elect to be treated as public patients in our hospitals. That's essentially how we have the universal access to um, free hospital care as part of a, our, our national Medicare system. So they're going to put that money into a national funding pool for it to be paid now on an activity-based funding basis for the most part. And uh, most importantly, in two years' time, which is a quite a long way away yet, uh, they will also be committed to helping to support the growth pressures in our system. And we'll talk a bit more about how that will work. But let's focus on the next two years, because the next two years are critical transitional years. And there's a lot that we have to achieve, achieve in, in that time to, to build this system. And if you look at how this has been implemented, both in other states and, and other countries, it is something where um, it, it you know, it takes a good five years for this process to start to roll through and, and, and to start to, to really um, uh, be transformative. Though on the other hand, I think we will also find from the 1st of July that we're in, a, in, in an environment where um, how, how the funds are allocated and how we, can, how we consider and talk about those issues will, will be fundamentally changed by this process of, of transparency. Um, but from the 1st of July, we will be moving to uh, a, an activity-based funding system within the national framework. Um, however, it's also important to emphasise the, that the, the overall funding framework in which that will operate will still be unique to each state and designed by each state necessarily. Uh, activity-based funding model that we're adopting will, will apply to those categories that we've listed there. Um, it will also have some block funding elements. The, the, there will be block funding for small country hospitals, uh, that, and they're defined, the small hospitals are defined of hospitals with separations fewer than 3,500. Uh, and teaching and research will be block funded. Um, the, uh, and uh, in the short term, uh, we're moving in this first year uh, of these two transitional years to the first three categories there, acute, ED and outpatients um, being on a, an ABF basis with subacute mental health and other non-admitted um, block funded and then taking a further 12 months to, to develop the ABF model for those, uh, for those services. But as I said, the overall funding model will be a matter for each state and territory. The other important um, considerations in this next two years is, as I said, the, the Commonwealth funding, which came in that lump sum um, uh, to the states, into state treasury, mixed with the state money, with state health authorities, and then allocated out to our health services. That special purpose payment uh, will, now, um, will now be paid uh, through a national pool, largely in the form of activity-based funding. But it's important to emphasise that there is, there is no additional growth uh, in those Commonwealth contributions for the next two years. That's a capped amount of money. We know what it's going to be. It, 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 it's um, in the Commonwealth budget for next year and the forward estimates for the, for the year after that. Um, uh, so, the, so the Commonwealth being, as I say, on the hook to pay for, for growth in our system won't happen until 1415. Um, the, uh, the Commonwealth price that they'll be paying uh, or share of the price they'll be paying will be determined by dividing the special purpose payment 
by the volumes of service in our state. So in this state, the special purpose payment funds about 34% of the cost of our local health district and network services. So, so the, the Commonwealth share of the, of the unit cost of delivering a patient episode in our service will, will, will come out at about 34%. So that's the underlying contribution the Commonwealth makes to uh, our health system, and that will now, most of it, morph into uh, an activity-based funding model. And that's the component that will be paid for the next two years through the national pool. The other challenges that we have to consider in these next two years is we also have a number of national partnership agreements that have been developed over the last few years with the Commonwealth, and that has led to significant funding uh, initiatives, which we've benefited from, uh, initiatives such as um, additional subacute beds, um, uh, waiting list reduction and various other funding streams. Uh, those uh, national partnerships are, 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 um, have provided significant growth funding into our system over the last couple of years. However, they're all f now for the next two years flatlining and some of them are actually um, expiring during that time. So, 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 the, um, so, the, so those growth in inflows won't be happening from the Commonwealth side. And, and for the next two years, the volume pressures on the system will, will need to be met by state governments from, from their resources. So, so it's quite a, we're looking at quite a tight budgetary environment for the next two years. To try and uh, sort of say, well, what does all this mean? This is really trying to break up for all our local health districts and specialty networks is, is um, where the money comes from um, and uh, how it breaks up then across these categories. So, so this is illustrative, not, not uh, finally definitive, um, but having tested it with a few, few board chairs and others have said that, that, that they've found it helpful in getting their heads around where does the money come from that, that a health service receives. So if, if uh, and just note that those numbers are all Bs for billion. Um, so of, of the funding we put out to, to the health system, you can see uh, in, in blue the, uh, for the next two years the Commonwealth components um, and, and the quant if we, this, I've taken this year's budget and broken it up into these boxes which are the sorts of boxes we'll be funding from in the future. So you can see the various Commonwealth and state shares coming into, into our system and, and they're sort of pro the size of the boxes aren't absolutely accurate but trying to give the proportionality. So the underlying Commonwealth funding through the special purpose payment um, in our current dollars splits 2.3 billion which would be activity funded services for those first three categories of, of um, admitted ED and outpatient. The lighter blue box is, is the other categories that will be block funded uh, in, the, in the first instance. Um, mental health, subacute, etc. small hospitals. Um, and the state funding components coming out of the, the state funding model um, in those categories. And then now for the first time in our systems from next year, we'll actually have some explicitly identified state only funded areas. And this is still debate, but in, sitting in there is depreciation because the Commonwealth's not contributing to capital, uh, community health services, um, drug and alcohol is proposed to be out. There's a proposal that forensic patients be out. There, so there's a number of big disputes as to what's in or out. We never had to have these discussions before because the previous model, the Commonwealth, as I say, made this contribution that was determined every five years, written into agreements, and the lump sum money landed in our state treasuries, but put in the mix of the state funding, and then came to your health authority, in this case previously the Department of Health, and then spread out to our system. Uh, so you didn't have to say whether it was or wasn't funding this particular service or that particular service. Now under this model, um, it will actually be finally defined what's in and out of scope. And of course, because the um, Commonwealth 100% of funding of things out of hospital, which was in the RUD plan, and also a recommendation of the National Health and Hospitals Reform Commission has uh, dropped out of the picture, it means we've got a number of services, some of which is community health, we actually really want to incentivise that are actually sitting over in the state only box, which does create some real challenges to, you know, how do we shift our models of care. So, so uh, that's sort of how, how it will split uh, um, next financial year um, or, and for the two transition years. From 1415, the, the changes are that 
then the Commonwealth not only contributes that underlying funding towards our core level of activity from the special purpose payment, but it will also now pay 45% and from 17, 18, 50% of a nationally efficient price set by the Independent Hospital Pricing Authority. And we, we have Tony Sherbin here to talk to us today. For in scope, that means those things the Commonwealth are saying are, and, and states sort of, and, and with HIPAA agreeing are in scope. Uh, for ABF and block funded services. So, uh, and growth is defined as both increases in volume over the base volumes and cost increases, the rate at which health costs accelerate year on year of public hospital services. So from the 1st of July, 2014, the Commonwealth will pay a blended price, which will probably come out in New South Wales at less than 40% of the national efficient price, because that price will be a blended price that combines their contribution to our core levels, which I've said probably comes out at about 34%, with them also paying for the growth element at 45 and then later 50%, and that'll blend to a payment of less than 40%. Over time, as, as growth continues year on year, the Commonwealth's share, overall share therefore will increase slightly, but someone did some maths that said that it'd take to 2050 before we got to the Commonwealth being, you know, sort of 49.5 per cent. So, um, so it's really just from, a, you know, obviously wearing a state hat here, really get clear that, that the Commonwealth is making an important contribution to growth, but that the state um, uh, is still very much the, the, the majority funder and carrying the funding risk of the system, which will still be a cap-funded system. But the idea is that how we build up that budget cap and, and what's within it and how we deal with growth and so on will be far more um, explicit and hopefully then uh, enable health services to, to operate in a more effective manner in terms of what resources they receive and then, then how they apply them. Uh, trying to draw that illustration, the box has shifted and, and uh, so we've got more, more in the ABF category of both the state sourced and Commonwealth sourced funds. Um, and we're also starting to get uh, the, the Commonwealth contribution um, uh, to growth as well. Uh, and it's important to acknowledge that the state component includes uh, money uh, from, from um, the, the, the state's funds raised through taxation and uh, revenue receipt sharing with the Commonwealth, et cetera, et cetera. But it also includes uh, the revenues which um, health services raise themselves uh, in terms of which need to acknowledge include some Commonwealth source funds such as uh, private patients, private health insurance, um, uh, medical benefits payments, pharmaceutical benefits payments, uh, the Commonwealth contribution to high cost drugs, which won't be going through the ABF payment. Uh, it includes payments by third party payers such as motor accident authorities and uh, workers' compensation for patients, plus income that um, uh, are received in the form of donations, uh, car parking fees. So, so, so the state component is a combination of, 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 the, of, uh, of um, revenues and, um, uh, and tax funded services. So that's the, so that's the source and quantum of funds. And again, the numbers I've used there are if we put this year's budget numbers in, into that framework. The other big change then comes with the funding flows. Now, the funding flows and how they work are of much more interest in Commonwealth state negotiations, particularly um, amongst all our treasuries um, and, and the chief financial officers of each of the state health funding authorities. For, uh, at, at the delivery end, um, the important thing is that um, is what money are you going to, to receive? But it is important to understand that there are some fundamental structural changes about the funding flows. Uh, first of all, for activity-based funded parts of, of uh, what's going to be funded, um, uh, the, uh, the, the funding, both Commonwealth and state funding, will be paid into uh, a national pool, a national funding pool, uh, into a New South Wales account in that funding pool. Um, the Commonwealth and state funding for in-scope block-funded services, um, such as small country hospitals, uh, will be paid into a state managed account, uh, which will play the block funding. And then there'll also be the third element of funding, uh, state only funding, which will be paid direct from the ministry. 
the, the critical thing is that the state will advise the National Health Funding Pool of the price, the volumes, the block ground amounts to be paid to local health districts and networks based on uh, the services agreements entered into between uh, the ministry and, and local health services. Uh, so that it, the critical um, uh, tool uh, in all of this will be that service agreement which um, will reflect uh, the range of services and the, and the dollars attached to those services in a very explicit way, as well as all the other policies and, and, and uh, um, program requirements and so on that um, is, is appropriate in, in each state to reflect each state's uh, health policies and, and health program funding initiatives. I don't expect you to take all of this in, in one glance, but it does create quite a complex set of funding flows. Um, but as I say, if you're at the receiving end, the important difference will be that you're, instead of your budget arriving in, um, once the budget's set and you're advised of it, it essentially arrives at districts in 52 equal parts once a week. Um, in terms of your cash flows, uh, it'll, 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 it'll come in, in three components to make up, up that budget. There will be the, um, the blended Commonwealth and state ABF payment coming from the national pool, which is the blue box on the, on the far, my, on the far your left. Um, there'll be the component for block funded services coming out of the state managed fund. And, uh, and then there'll be, as I said, the, the state only funds that flow from the, from the ministry. Um, the, the national pool is just a transactional hub. It, it, uh, it requires legislation federally and in each state. The fund administrator will be a, a, a state person um, under state law, state auditor general, state direction for the state funds at the same time as, as they wear the same role for the Commonwealth in respect to the Commonwealth funds. So it's quite a clever piece of legislation but allows the funds to be pooled and allocated. But they're pooled and allocated in accordance with the, the, the specifications of the service agreement. And of course, in New South Wales, we started the, that service agreement model this year. So as a, as a sort of a working model into which we can now put the activity-based funding. To, In terms of grappling with this whole concept about price, it's really important to understand that the pricing of services will operate at three levels. There's the national efficient price, which is what IPA is all about. It's, IPA is independent and uh, sets the national price. Uh, essentially, the national price determines the Commonwealth contribution because under the agreement from 1415, the Commonwealth is on the hook to pay um, a, 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 a given share of that national efficient price wherever that lands and that price will be a blend of the pricing all around the country and and of course all the states have different pricing um, what it looks like when we mush all the pricing together for all the different types of care we haven't seen those sorts of uh, comparisons yet um, because some of those models haven't yet been developed but certainly when you look at admitted patients DR, you know DRGs essentially around the country that sort of data has been around for a long time so under those models and we don't always compare apples and oranges but Victoria is the cheapest um, New South Wales is the next cheapest and of the biggest states WA is the most expensive that's the sort of spread of you know um, of uh, the cost of running our system so the national efficient price um, will be a blended price and on that model we'll be on the on on the cheaper side of the national efficient price um, the, then there's also and more probably more importantly from in terms of what the district receives there is, is the state price and the state funding model because it's the overall state pricing that will deter and funding model that will determine what each local health district receives and then the national efficient price contribution from the Commonwealth will be a subset of that. And then thirdly, there'll be uh, local health district or network pricing because each, each health service will have to organise how to allocate its funds. It will need to allocate out of those funds, funds to overheads. It will then need to work out how it will fund each of its constituent um, hospitals and, and, and other services. Uh, if we take um, a district such as um, South East Sydney, 
um, and uh, Terry Clout, the chief executive there, will be on the panel after morning tea. Uh, South East Sydney ha has been working with this kind of model for the last three years, so they're at quite a sophisticated level of development now in terms of that internal pricing and distribution model, and that's a model that they've developed in, in uh, close consultation uh, with their clinicians, uh, with, the, with their board, uh, and as I understand it is, is a model that's, that's well understood within that district. Uh, across the board, we, we need to be developing and supporting the development of that capacity right across our system. Another important concept is this very new concept that appeared for the first time in the IPA determination, and I presume Tony Sturban will refer a bit more to this, is the National Weighted Activity Unit. Um, uh, what IPA is recommending is, and, and I think certainly we've written back supporting this approach, uh, and we're endeavouring to put our funding model into this structure, is that we take the various elements of activity-based funding and, and put it into one single scale or classification uh, system. Uh, at the moment, we've got acute admitted patients who have been long measured for a long time by uh, um, Australian DRGs. Uh, we've got two different systems for la large and smaller um, hospitals for measuring ED attendances. And there's a new and very fledgling measure for outpatient uh, uh, services as well. And uh, what he was proposing is we blend those into a single unit. So we now have a, another acronym, the NWA, um, and uh, and that will become the, the the unit that gets that gets priced and and which builds up the budgets. And I've just included a quote there from. Um, IPA as to how they see the potential of blending all of these things and as we then start to add mental health and subacute and other things in, into this over time, that, that, uh, that it makes it easier to, to look at substitution of services or would we be better to buy this service here in this setting or buy it over in that setting and to be able to see very transparently the different uh, cost weights against those different uh, models of care. In terms of managing the transition, our key priority during the next two transition years is to keep the system safe and operating while we're introducing some critical new funding drivers. And certainly when you look at, while Australia is late to proceed here and New South Wales amongst the other states is the last cab off the rank on ABF, I think um, WA and Queensland actually kicked off this year. Um, and of course some places like um, Victoria and South Australia have had these funding models for a very long time. But all the feedback uh, is, is that, that um, uh, you need to proceed with caution, not overload the model with too many adjustments and refinements and so on. That can happen over time. One of the strong messages in talking with the UK folk when they introduced this approach uh, five, six years ago uh, was to... to um, to proceed with caution as you try to, don't try and solve everything by adding a loading to your price because you can be trying to load it to, to push things in this direction and not realise you've created a perverse incentive for things to go in quite another direction so that we go step by step. So we'll ha have a, a cautious and evolving approach to, to, to the model. Um, that we will be using transition grants to um, support those local health districts whose, whose cost of operation um, uh, is currently above where it would otherwise be if you if you priced it according to to the, the new transparent funding model and initially those local health districts that operate at or below the efficient price will be funded at their current efficient rate and and what happens over time is those from experience in other systems is that those that are above the price come down over time uh, and, and there is a convergence uh, to the mean. We're also looking over time at how we um, create ex incentives uh, and rewards for, for those that are operating at, at that uh, lower price. We also have to look seriously when, when uh, districts or, or networks are at a lower price um, how that lines up against the volumes and so on and their pattern of services and, and, and whether we've got the, the funding um, uh, amounts right as well. Um, 
So, uh, and our state pricing structure, we'll, we'll adopt the IPA design. You, you, we don't want to have one national design and then a different state design. This is complex enough without creating confusion. At the moment, in IPA's draft determination, they're proposing loadings for specialist paediatric uh, hospital services, Indigenous patients, and services provided to patients from outer regional or remote locations. So we'll in incorporate those uh, in our design. Uh, previously, when we've had shadow state models, we've had peer hospitals and some other adjustments. We're not going to do that. We will align with the, the national model. Just to give a flavour of the sort of the spread of, uh, of, um, uh, of funding um, of districts, I haven't named anybody at this stage because uh, we're still resting with data and quantums and so on. But um, uh, just to, it gives you a size if we if we convert all our districts into NWAs for acute admitted and ED blended into one payment and 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 put their budgets together on that basis, uh, that just shows the 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 against no scale, but it just gives you a sense of the spread of uh, uh, of districts through to the cheapest to the most expensive against. Um, against that model. Of course, the first issue is, you know, is the data correct and is the coding right? And, and uh, in our first year, there'll be a lot to sort out about um, uh, have we, have we, um, ha is the coding right? And also the cost allocation right? Because we're also finding that um, that, that somebody who might be cheap on the admitted side is more expensive on the ED side or is more expensive in some of those block funded services and that goes to um, at the moment how their costs are apportioned in the cost um, uh, reporting tools that we have. So there's a lot to sort out but it's only when you move to actually feeding back here's your budget if we broke it up on the basis of what you do rather than what you've traditionally received um, that you can start to, to interrogate that and get all those things right. Um, so what does it really mean then in terms of our funding model and a service agreement to move, to move to one that's based on this far more transparent model that is, is um, in the first instance next year, 70% of what we do will be ABF'd and then when mental health and subacute et cetera come on, that percentage will increase. So you know, the larger part of budgets will be based on ABF. For the first time, uh, a district health service receiving its budget can, will actually be able to see how the funds are built up related to the activity uh, that, 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 um, uh, that they're uh, required to, to deal with, uh, um, having regard for where they were last year and the sort of growth that, that, that they're experiencing. Uh, it'll be um, built up into those various categories, inpatient activity, uh, the ED activity, outpatients, and then each, each of those areas we've talked about a block grant and other state programs. Um, it will uh, explicitly have, the, for inpatient and ED, the volumes. At outpatient, because the data is so ropey, um, all of the states in, in our conversations are saying that we'll effectively have to block grant that for next year while we try and you know, sort of uh, refine the, find the data systems. Um, but it, it, it will be a very different looking budget. I was having a conversation with um, some, some people from some, some of our boards, um, people who have uh, come from outside the health system and hearing that and sort of saying, well, so what? Um, how, how is that going to make it different? Um, to try and explain how different this is. This is very different from what I've always called the black box funding model of the historical funding model, which is essentially last year's budget plus or minus adjustments for this year's budget plus enhancements and growth on top. To, to illustrate that black box model of funding, which is how everybody would have got their budget allocation this year and in, in uh, every year before that, this is, this is a, a sample district. Um, and the most important thing to note is that most of the funding, half a billion dollars, just it comes as base budget, which relates to last year escalated for you know, cost increases of you know, uh, salaries and wages going up, et cetera. And then there's a number of budget enhancements that come through the budget. Um, and that gives you the new 
black box budget. It, it, it's, as, it's as crude as that in terms of how the budget's received and then, then that has to be reinterpreted into what that means in terms of how, the, how the, that funding relates to the job of work that each of those services are meant to do. And the, and the, the quantum there is, um, is entirely, uh, well, it's a product of, of history interacting with various policy initiatives and budget initiatives over time. And the result is you get that spread that I showed you of those different districts in terms of what they cost for, the, for, for a consistent range of services. What we're moving to, the allocation letter, and this is a, a mock-up version, um, is something that's far more explicit uh, and, uh, um, and I can't take you through all of this spreadsheet, but the, the, the critical things to, to note, let's see, it does some fancy things here, which I'm not quite sure how this works. What's the... So this is, uh, this is this year's budget, which we've taken the budget they received and, and where they actually are likely to land. In terms, and this, is a, this really is, a, we've mocked this one up, uh, so it isn't any particular district. Um, and where, at the moment, the district and ourselves are forecasting where it will land. It's actually going to land with a, a, a budget deficit, and it is a district, a hypothetical district, that's already working on its turnaround plan to get itself back in, into budget. Um, and uh, so then when we're, and if you take those one from the other, you can, can see it's, it's budget shortfall that it's working on. And they've got a few of our districts in this position. I'm sure some of you can identify with this. Um, uh, for next year, we're, we'll actually um, be building this up from, there's the acute volumes expressed in as DRGs and ED volumes as uh, the various classification systems we have. Um, they'll morph in, into a, a single UR volume. Uh, we haven't put any particular price in there, though you can do some math, but it's a hypothetical price because we're still waiting on some of the key elements to firm that up. Um, but, but what we see here is that, that this district now has, has budgets in these categories related to the volume of patients there to treat, based, and that volume, and that's all weighted for acuity and mix. And it, it still has its turnaround plan of its budget deficit it has to work on. It's on here's a, its transition grant, which it's on notice that when you construct its budget according to the various categories, it should have this much, but it needs an extra six million to bring it up to the level of last year's. So we're, we're keeping it whole going to next year's, but they're on notice that, that, that this is an issue that needs to be addressed. It can be coding, it can be some structural inefficiencies that, that need solutions uh, that involve some capital, or it can be, and, and quite, uh, quite often goes to uh, models of care, lengths of stay challenges, availability of uh, um, services in the community that patients can be discharged to. But it starts to put all our health services on notice as to, um, uh, as to that, that discrepancy. Um, and, and this is a far, and it's broken up by these various categories. And then behind this can be a, 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 a much more comprehensive unpacking of, of where the money's going and what services it's buying. This will lead overall to very different conversation, uh, both at the, at the local service level, the local board level, as well as between health services and the ministry, and then in turn between the ministry and treasury about what funding we need to run the health system, where it's being applied, and, uh, and a very different conversation. Just to sum up, there's a number of key state issues which, um, which I've highlighted uh, there. Um, uh, particular ones I want to flag is the, that um, for innovation, some people ask me, well, how do new things get started? This, this still reinforces previous history of volumes and so on but it's, it, the state funding model provides for um, payment of innovation and, and start-up models um, outside the ABF. Obviously, once then a new service gets up and running and, and, and functioning, then it can start to be funded uh, through its volumes. Uh, that loadings on pricing are not the only lever for getting change in the system, and we have to look at a whole comprehensive range of... of uh, uh, of um, initiatives uh, around accountability to reporting, uh, funding requirements, which can, um, uh, 
which can create uh, incentives and structures and frameworks to support moving towards the right models of care. Pricing is, is one of those, but, but not the only one. Um, we have an ABF readiness uh, uh, review process which has been completed and each district now has a, a comprehensive assessment um, uh, developed with, 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 the, with the district itself about uh, the things it needs to have in place uh, and the work it needs to do to, to be ready to operate in this environment. We also still have a raft of uh, issues at the national level that we're still hotly debating and uh, I've just listed a few of, the, a few of those there. Um, the, the, um, the debate about what's in scope and out of scope for, for Commonwealth funding and for ABF is a critical one. Um, but uh, how we um, treat private patients in this mix and the funding flows in relation to that, how we treat privately referred non inpatients is a, is, a, is a major focus, how we develop the funding models for mental health and subacute, uh, just to give you um, uh, a flavour of, so, of some of the issues that are still very much in play. So look, there we have it. Um, that's a lot to digest, but as I say, during the course of the day, there's a chance to start to unpack this and to ask questions and to dive deeper. It is a fundamental reform. It is, it is not just about um, a different budget model um, that satisfies the bean counters. It is a model that starts to fundamentally relate the, um, the state health budgets to um, a system as to where that money's going and, and what it's doing. And then that leads to all sorts of appropriate questions. Is it doing the right things? It also allows for a much more rational discussion about um, the adequacy of funding, uh, the sorts of conversations we'll be having between ourselves and, and Treasury uh, going forward will be much more about Here's the, here's the, the you know, sort of the, the pressures, volumes, demands, costs, uh, benchmark pricing, benchmark models that we have to face. Here's the, here's the um, you know, what are the right funding models, levers, rates of increase and so on that the state within its budget framework has to seek to support rather than the much more traditional historical models which are all about um, uh, various interests lobbying to get their particular interest in, in, in front of uh, government and to take priority. This, this model leads to a much more transparent assessment of that. But most importantly, it will provide real information locally to understand what's going on, understand where the money comes from, what it's going to, and then with our local devolved model, uh, uh, to be able to uh, make much more of those decisions locally, as well as to engage in what's going to be a much more ad hoc conversation uh, with the funder <laughs> and, and the purchaser, the ministry, about uh, how we fund these services, how we design them, what we need to do on a statewide basis to support you in delivering services, uh, giving you the tools to be able to, to start to say, if I, um, in talking this through with Brian McCorn recently, uh, if you go back to that, uh, that budget we had that, there it is, this is the traditional budget, that the health debate tends to be about the 2%, if we're lucky, extra things, which are all this list of things that were new budget initiatives that got parcelled out that year, and we don't go and debate what's going on here with the 98% of the funding and, how, how, and what we do with that, and that's quite critical to this model to unpack that and work out how we best apply those funds not just add on these enhancements uh, that, that come each year in, in, in increments of you know two percent or so. So that's it, and uh, um, and I'm sorry if I've crowded the next speaker's time. We'll work something out. Thank you. <laughs>